So uh, I don't really feel like I should be here because um, <laughs> I, I was supposed to be like a rock star and it didn't work out, so I do computer science instead. Uh, it's a long story. But there is a happy ending. I get to hang out with the INCF crew. They're so awesome. It's like a great place to be. So um, this is, I think, a good, like, solid, solid ending to my sad story. Um, basically, the title here is very long, but it, it it's, can be summed up in data sharing, or actually like a prelude to data publishing, maybe. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk to you about. A little bit of, uh, in, in terms of our context, we're trying to do open science in Montreal. We've, we have all sorts of initiatives, and one of them is COMP. That stands for Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform. Um, but before I get into that, I want to kind of say a few things. Um, so this, this is a slide I stole from JB, who I think stole it from Marianne. And I don't know how far it goes, but I've cited the people, so there we go. Um, either way, it's kind of, it's a very telling slide in my view, because uh, a lot of the reason why we're trying to do open science is precisely this here. So yes, we're trying to enable scientific discovery. There's all sorts of reasons that have been cited already. But you know, even if I was just a, a bureaucrat of some kind and I saw this figure, that would be very telling, right? 200 billion maybe is an estimation of dark data data that never really sees the light of day, that data is often lost, you know, like, so that's a huge waste on the system. It's a waste for us. It's money that could be better spent. So this is one of the overarching reasons why we uh, are doing open science. Um, this is the platform that uh, we've launched about a year ago. Uh, it's an $11 million grant from Brain Canada. Uh, it's, it, it's a three-year mission. Um, we're about uh, one, one and a half years into it. Um, and our goal ultimately is just to share data. I'll tell you a little bit more in terms of the details of what we're exactly doing. Um, but a couple more overarching principles. I won't spend any time on this because I think everyone here has heard a lot about FAIR. It's definitely a great idea and a concept and um, I'm happy that it's been quantified or qualified. So that's something that governs what we do. Um, sort of Pursuant to that, we did uh, we we wrote our own best practices for uh, you know neuroimaging, and they're they're based I guess on the fair principles, um, and they work really nicely with uh, like governing bodies like INCF who do standards and best practices. So um, we've kind of tried to translate that into something that people the average scientist can actually use. So that's the preamble. Now the actual plan of what COMP is. Um, so this was. When I first started, like almost 20 years ago in this field, uh, this was sort of my reality. And we've, I think we've come a long way. The current plan is this up here, which is a lot of things, but basically it just, wants, it just illustrates the amount of technology that we have you know, used, borrowed, created to come up with a design that hopefully will work to share data. So um, in more simple terms, the actual central repo that will sort of house, or to be the, will be your portal effectively to get data from the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform is, is based on, uh, you know, Git, Git Annex, Datalad, and a bunch of standards. So this is what it looks like. I'll get into a few more details about this in a second. There's other low-hanging fruit that are, is pretty useful, I think. So something called the DATS model. It's a way to describe, what we, we use it for, is a way to describe uh, data sets. So, you know, you need, it's important to have metadata and provenance for each individual piece of raw data. But to start, so this is not hard to do, we could, everyone who has a study or a data set of some kind could probably describe it in a very concrete way that can then used, be used to be automated, can be automated and you can like search for it much more easily and share it amongst other repositories. So this is one of the things that we're pushing as, as a low hanging fruit. There's other considerations for our platform. So, you know, there's open data sharing. That's really easy. You just put data on a website somewhere in terms of the, the at least the ethical issues or the, or the, the concept of it. Um, but it's, you know, that, that ha you have to, first of all, get ethics for that. That's not that easy. But the technological uh, implementation of it doesn't need to be too complicated. There's closed data, which was a bunch of data use agreements. Uh, that's, that's been science for the most part. And uh, you have to you know, fill out all these forms and, and have all kinds of complicated bureaucracies. We're, we're introducing a new model called registered access where 
you can be authenticated by members in your community. Um, so there's a, we're working on this in terms of exactly how to implement it, but it's something that's going to come to fruition in the next few months. Um, I also stole this from JB, but uh, it's something that's very much part of our experiences. So we kind of have this anecdotal gap analysis. We Just with all our experience, we know exactly some of the problems that have, ha have occurred. There's articles about the cost of fare, for example, that you could use as a reference. But data is still very hard to find and sometimes even harder to access. It's not usually open or very shareable. It's not well documented and it's not well standardized. And it's still difficult for researchers to share. If you're an individual and you just want to try to share your data, you run into problems. And another key is that it's, the, the data is not persistent or, as, you, as you've heard many times, reproducible. So we have some you know, governing principles that we've adopted. You've kind of, they are along the lines of FAIR. But um, our, the way that we're going to deal with data is it has to be distributed. So you can, you can have your own repo, and then we'll crawl that and, and try to make the data available. The governance of, of the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform is also a distributed model. There's many players with their own databases, different kinds of ways of sharing data. So that's important. Um, Portals will have to have direct access to the metadata, so we'll make the metadata and data available to everybody. Um, they have to, the, the metadata has to exist for both the files and, um, and for the data sets as a whole, like I was telling you about the DATS model. Uh, tools are, need to be versioned. Um, we have checksums and things, other kinds of hashes that we use to ensure the integrity. Um, we, we are very conscious about privacy regulations. We're about to, we've already released human data, which I'll tell you about in a second. And we want to make sure that it's absolutely de-identified and you know, uh, in line with any kind of ethics and privacy regulations. Um, the, also, it's, it, we want to make this available through a UI, but also for all the geeks out there with APIs and you know, make, it, make it easy to share data. So let me tell you about what we've actually um, shared so far. We had an uh, annual meeting in Toronto in March and uh, May, I think. And um, this was our first you know, data set. This is what we actually, you know, made available and open or at least uh, registered. So the Open Prevent AD, it's totally open. You just have to sign in for, you have to get create an account just for, um, for our own sort of tracking purposes, see who downloads what and try to mold to, to that. But it's open data. There's no permission that you need to get. Um, it's an Alzheimer's study and there's about 500 subjects. And there's all kinds of imaging data, full battery modalities, fMRI, uh, MRI, you name it, um, and, and some behavioral metrics. There's more data coming. Some of it will come under the registered access. But uh, this is a very, uh, like, it's a pretty big milestone in our field. It's kind of like uh, ADNI, but uh, totally open. Um, there's uh, some uh, phantom data. There's a researcher that actually has scanned himself like 73 times here, I think. Um, I don't know why. I don't know any, why anyone would want to do that. I did that by accident, and I've released uh, my data as well. I, w I just I got signed up for uh, this maybe 15 years ago. Someone said, "Hey, do you want to just do a couple of scans? You can go to, you know, Seattle or something." It sounded great. 15 years later, and hundreds of scans, hours in the scanner later. Ew, I don't know if I would ever recommend that. But now that I'm there, I want the world record. I want to hold on to it. So, just saying. <laughs> Um, there's other data that we had already released before, but it's under the context of COMP as well. It's the big brain. This is the highest resolution brain, 3D reconstruction of a brain based on histology um, that's ever been created. <coughs> and it's at a 20 micron resolution. You probably, some of you may have heard of it, about it already, but that's available as well, fully open. Um, there's also an EEG initiative that we've uh, released uh, in Montreal. and. Um, it's, it's, it, we've created a kind of a cool viewer where you can overlay the electrodes uh, on the different regions of the brain and, uh, and, and you can see the, uh, the signals um, for every one of those electrodes. So that was uh, kind of nice. And this is what the portal uh, looks like. We haven't officially launched it yet. Uh, there's a prototype that we've worked on, but sometime in the next few months there'll be an official launch and you'll hear about it. This is some of the other data that we're going to release. Uh, soon enough as well. So just to show you that the scope's increasing. I have all sorts of people coming and uh, interested in sharing data. So if you're one of them, please come talk to us. Um, the other parts of COMP, there's many parts. There's training, which I won't speak to too much. I'll talk more about the infrastructure. 
Um, I just explained about the data, but there's also computational infrastructure that uh, we have. This is just an example of a pipeline to, to show you the complexities of some of the things that we, we, we do in-house. Um, I'll start again with the low-hanging fruit. Uh, boutiques is a, a, a way to describe pipelines in an efficient way. So this was created uh, by Tristan Glatald, and a lot of times, for those of you that are into high-performance computing, you will, you will you will install you know, code, pipeline software, and it can get kind of tedious. If you know what you're doing, that's great, but if you wanted to like, make other people share your pipelines with others, it's hard to recreate that on, a, on another HPC. So he's created a standardized uh, system that you can describe your data set, and then you can use that in an automated way. Um, so that's, that's, that's easy enough to do, and then you can like, containerize your pipelines and, and go from there. There is a backend that we've created for many years uh, in Montreal called Seabrain. Uh, it's a high performance computing environment that basically abstracts the complexities of all that stuff that I was talking about and you, could, you don't have to, you can be kind of a naive user, you can be a neuroscientist without much computing experience and still be able to launch your pipelines using the portal. If you have more experience then you can get into the weeds of it. So this, this allows you to, in a very distributed way, launch a pipeline from Tokyo you know, from, with data from Montreal and then output it into, into Stockholm or something like that. So that, this, this is quite a powerful tool and that'll be one of the back ends for COMP. There can be others. Um, and I, I stole this from Dell when I was hanging out with them, but uh, some, one of the things that drives what we do, I think, and will drive us much more, is AI or deep learning, machine learning techniques. So just, this is just to illustrate the complexities of the kinds of tools that they have and use and things that will be probably, you know, um, like experiencing soon enough. I think the, uh, the deep learning movement will very much affect the open science movement and big data that we deal with. So this is uh, worth noting. Uh, don't tell Dell I stole it from them. Um, so there's more. There's th this wasn't necessarily that easy to accomplish. So there's a whole process into this. First and foremost, if you want to share data, you have to have ethics. And this can be really complicated depending on what country you're in, depending on your ethics board. There's so many factors that influence it and they're not necessarily uh, the same rules everywhere you go. There's some overarching principles about how to you know, get ethics. We have created, uh, in, in getting uh, registered access for example, we've created a template that I think a lot of institutions can use. We often get asked about, uh, you know, like, well, I would like to share data, but I don't, I don't know what to tell the ethics board. So, you know, we have this ethics framework that maybe can be adapted, and I find people are more, if they see someone's already done it, they're more willing to, to actually follow your lead. Um, there's also curation. Uh, people were talking about it at the end of the seminar yesterday uh, about, you know, what, how, uh, the complexities of this, or why, isn't this, why is there no, not more value in um, focusing on the curation. So this is something that I do for sure. And, uh, and it is a very, it, there was a lot of work that went to curation. There's a lot of sides to it. I could, tell, I could explain more maybe during the panel session if anyone has questions um, about exactly what's involved in curating data, but there, there's, there's a fair bit and this is something that I think we've gone through the full process from, from acquisition all the way to dissemination. Another important thing is quality control. This is something that everyone needs to do. If you're sharing open data, some people like to just share data that's you know, maybe not curated very well and that's a perspective. But a lot of people appreciate when the data is cleaned and there's not too many you know, artifacts in them and it's well organized and there's all sorts of quality control. In fact, Pradeep here, wherever he is, he's starting this whole INCF quality control standardization effort. So uh, that's something that I think will be very valuable. And so, you know, regardless of what your perspective is on QC, uh, you, I think uh, it, it could use, you know, some standardization. Also, interoperability. This is one of the themes of the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform. Uh, as much as I would like, you know, Loris, for example, to be the database of the whole planet, um, that's probably not going to happen. So what is key is to have interoperability between all kinds of different systems. Um, there is standardization that INCF, I think, could very much support as well in terms of, you know, the APIs. Like, how, like there's so many different ways to, to transfer data in an, automatic, an automated way. Doing, having standardization in neuroscience would probably benefit everyone in this room. So these are, these are other central core initiatives that are part of COMP and we are we're pushing them. Uh, there's DataLad as well, which is um, part of the technology that we use to uh, to house uh, metadata. 
We've written crawlers for it. It's, it's a software that's written by uh, Michael Hanke, who's amazing and smart and cool, and uh, Yaroslav Halchenko. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I told you I was going to make fun of you, so there you go. Uh, he's smart too. Um, anyway, so uh, this is something that probably could be used by a lot of people. Does it, it's not just our context. So I would encourage you to investigate to see how you can you know, adapt DataLad to your own uh, data sets. Um, one other little thing that we have created is a kind of is our own checklist of how to make data go open. We've done it within our own context. It's it's right now a little more centric to our experiences, the, our software, our data. But this is something that will will generalize even more. Um, it was based on our first round for Prevent AD. It took a long time actually to curate that data. I think a lot of people underestimate the amount of time it takes to, you know totally organize and clean and you know go through all the different steps to make your data go open. So this is our first pass. We're going to probably release it as a maybe as a preprint or something like that. Um, so this is uh, coming and um, there's one last point that I, I guess I want to make and that's that one of the goals is also about data publishing. So I think you saw this slide earlier um, but basically there are initiatives different kinds of new journals like the one at HBM that is looking to potentially uh, share data that's more along the lines of data publishing. So it's not just about, you know, the traditional scientific journals, but, but uh, you know, sharing everything that you have, your notebooks, your data sets. And uh, the underlying principle, this came up, uh, I think I was drunk, but it was uh, over beers with uh, Pierre Belek and Nikola Shtikov, who are the communications wing of this whole, uh, of the, the, the publishing side for CMP. And uh, it's, a, it's an idea called NeuroLibre where we basically create the underpinnings for what any journal, any open journal could use to, uh, to sort of uh, organize your, the scripts that you use, organize the data and run these things in a more automated way, you know, from, from, from like different places. So um, I can give you more details about this if you want, but this is something that uh, has already been done for CMP and uh, we're, we've released it, it's all open source and it's going to become more and more elaborate. So for those that are in the publishing industry, you may want to take advantage of these kinds of concepts. So that's, uh, that's another thing. And uh, I guess that's basically it. So, you know, for those of you who want to discuss more, I will be at Pablo Lolek later. So feel free to join and uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>